idea for the room. How many licensed applicators or applicators working under a licensed applicator do we have here? How many are ad licensed? Do you have a vector license category 12? How many are structurally licensed? Do you have a structural license? Certified applicator. Okay, I have a few. I right. am. <laughs> okay, so we're going to discuss a few things. Obviously, we're tag teaming here today. I'm a structural specialist. Perry is an ag specialist. So, first, I'm briefly going to describe kind of the difference why we have two pesticide laws and two different specialists here, in a way, covering this information. Uh, we're also going to discuss the uh, revisions, and Perry's going to handle this, the revisions to the regulations for the ag code. The latest revisions. These were adopted last month. We're going to discuss direct supervision requirements and supervision requirements for structural. We're going to discuss root use records for both ag and structural. There's different. Shocking. We're going to discuss the top 10 non-compliance issues for structural commercial businesses. There's not a whole lot of you here, so I'll go really quickly over that. We're going to discuss the testing procedures because they have changed. So both ag and structural tests very similarly now. So if you're planning on sending someone to test, you want to know this information. And last but not least, we're going to discuss um, a little bit of the ag aspect of the fetal applications and what our law and rule has to say about it. So, first, and I turn, I keep losing it, so I'm going to move it over here so I can actually learn that. Um, so, first, there are two different statutes that oversee or regulate pesticide applications in the state of Texas. One's the Agricultural Code, Chapter 76, and the other is the Occupations Code, Chapter 1951. Uh, Occupations Code is a structural applicator. So if you're licensed structurally, that is your prevailing law. If you're licensed under the Act Code or the Category 12, which is now public health pest control, you're licensed under the Agriculture Code. They say kind of vastly different things. They're not very similar, other than the fact that they both regulate pesticide applicators. And we're going to kind of go into this and why there's two different. Um, hopefully, the legislature one day will combine the laws to make our lives easier, but I'm not holding my breath for it. I haven't seen any law come through yet. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to go into Perry's stuff. So, uh, thanks, guys, for having us out here. Uh, the reason we have two different rules is to confuse the hell out of you. That way we have jobs. You have to call us and ask them, what am I supposed to be doing? Uh, so are we doing a good job? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Allison, all work is done. Um, we've got a lot of slides to go over. A lot of times, um, associations ask us to come speak to them about updates and laws and regs. And well, fortunately, we don't have a whole bunch. And that's a good thing. But that means you guys are doing a good job. When there are a whole bunch of changes, that means you guys are screwing up and we have to put more laws on you. So luckily we haven't had to do that in a long time. And really the updates we're going to talk about today are really just kind of um, basic small changes that we just needed to make sure we clarified in law and such. So they're not really huge ones. There's a couple that will affect you. Um, but not to the extent that it's going to make your lives miserable, okay? And if it does for some reason, uh, I left all my business cards at work. You can email her and she will take care of that for you. Uh, eight seconds to chapter seven administrative rules were changed. Um, they're filed for amendment or deletion from November 21st. There's a 30 day period where you have public comment. That went from November 21st to December 20th. There was only like one negative comment out there. We addressed it. That association didn't have a problem with it. So we were able to adopt all the changes on January 28th, 2015. What happens there is then you have another 20 days before it gets adopted. It goes into full effect February 17th is when that occurred. So now we're working under some of the new changes that we uh, under the new changes that we made. But in some of them, it's going to be a process. Our inspector's going to be out there working with you and getting you into this compliance um, mode. So it's not going to be because the changes occur, everything's going to happen all of a sudden and overnight. Okay, so don't worry about that. Now. Uh, we're going to go through 7.1, 21, 24, 27, 30, 32. 33 and 35. Um, we do have three hours here, right? Am I correct on that? No? <laughs> no, you're getting this special next week. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, like I said, a lot of these are small changes, and we'll go through them. Some won't affect you. I won't spend a whole lot of time on there. One, for instance, to show you how kind of a small change it is, it used to be in the law that said Texas Agriculture and Extension Service. Well, now they're called Agri-Life, so we made that change. That's simple enough. No big deal, it's just working. 
Now, that's a great perhaps state of certification. We have a definition for all categories. So now all the categories and the rules, we've always had definitions that we work off of, but now this is in the, um, in the, in the rule. It explains it out. A lot of these were, some of them were like for changes, such as the oil industry. Our uh, right of way, we used to just think about the right of way. In, in, in general, sir, in your mind, what is a right of way? What do you think of when you think of right of ways? The area beside the road, pretty cut dry. Well, we, had, we didn't have areas for all these oil field guys that were going out and spraying wellheads and taking care of areas around the wellheads or equipment pads, these bleachy pads that they were setting up and stuff like that. We always just kind of assumed and put it in the right of way, but it really didn't define it. So what we did through some of these definitions was make better uh, definitions of them and clarify that so we could use those in those instances. Uh, deleted chemication and anti fouling paint. Um, back in the 90s, that was a, a big uh, category that a lot of companies were using out on the coast. We've hardly had any of those come through. Uh, the chemigation part, not as much chemigation going on as there used to be, so we've removed those two. Uh, we had uh, soil fumigation. Uh, fumigants have gotten a lot more stricter on their usage and such. Uh, so we decided that we needed a category that specifically defined fumigation and its uses and uh, made sure that we're testing the, the competency of these applicators better than we had in the past. So we made those changes there. Now we added category 12, public health pest control, the vector control. And this for employees of public entities or a person working under contract for a public entity. Uh, it's required by law when transferred from DSHS. Sometimes it goes to government and moves slow. This is one of those instances. But we've always regulated it, we've always worked with planks on it, we've always made sure that there was law following it. But now it's in the system where it shows that we do regulate and enforce those uh, rules for it. Um, so that was, you know, back in 07 when DSHS relinquished uh, their authority of this particular uh, program to us. Um, that's, like I said, that's where we, we made that change. We finally got around to it. Uh, the other one is um, the category is for use of restricted use pesticides or general use vector control product when applied by air or power driven foggers only. That's going to be a change a little bit later that I'll talk about in how we're looking at that. And I'll explain to you a little bit more when we get, when we get to that part. Some of the other things we had were like category name changes. If you look, for instance, uh, field crop pest control, this became field crop. A lot of these things had things in there such as pest control in them. All we did was remove that. Citrus pest control, this became citrus. If you look at M44, it has M44 device. Forest pest control stays the same. One of the changes, and whenever I talk to non-commercial political applicators, generally, of course, this is the majority of your vector control, but how many of y'all have the 3A category? You still want one known term. Then we also deal with how many of y'all have category 5, the right of way. See, a lot of non commercial political subdivisions have that. They have somebody who can do work in all those areas. So these are the major changes that are occurring to the non political licenses. Is the 3A plant pest and weed control became a nice case name. Where this becomes important to some of you who may or may not have it, maybe in a supervisory position or somebody that can move up. If you ever go apply for this um, particular category, the 3A, it's not going to be one of them turf anymore. It's going to be the landscape maintenance. So whenever you go to the test for it, that's what you're going to have to ask for. And we'll explain a little bit more of that later in the testing process. Another one was like I talked about the right of way pest control. Now it's called vegetation management, which by definition now encompasses a lot more areas that can be sprayed other than just the right of way. Now, like I said, we've always had an understanding of it. But now we have them black and white of what those areas are, and they're more defined. And like I said, a big part of that was some of the oil industry and what was going on out there. Then, like number 10, at one time we were going to use that for chlorine gas that was like used in public water systems. Uh, that never came about. Uh, Lemon wasn't used in the old days, and now it's going to be our soil fumigation one. And then category 12, which is what all y'all have. It's still a public health pest control. Uh, it used to be called vector control, but this is its official name now, public health pest control. Uh, applicator certification, uh, that's category 12 uh, for employees of public entities or a person working under contract for a public entity. Can you make a backwards? It is. Uh, 
But here, if you're using the mosquito guns and you're getting a new product, that doesn't require licensing for this. Okay? Um, license does not cover entry to private property. That is something else we'll discuss in a little bit. We had a few conversations earlier in the year about that. Um, one thing about the dumps that I would like to talk about is we could not be repackaging the dumps. Okay? Anytime a pesticide is sold, it is sold with a complete label. It must stay intact until it is distributed to the individual who could use it. So we can't take big bags of products, break them down, and put them into smaller packs that don't have the uh, complete label with them. Because by EPA's definition, that's considered producing. And that's a whole other category you don't want to go into because of how much it costs and what it requires to do. So you cannot break down big packages into smaller packages and distribute them. I know at one time there were a lot of cities trying to figure out how they could get maybe some citizen help on doing that. You can do it if you take a full product and were to hand the whole product to an individual as long as it's only general use, but you can't do it to where you take that product out of its original container, redistribute it in another package, and you don't have complete labeling or anything. You can't repackage it. That's just basically the bottom line. Because again, that goes into becoming producer establishment by EPA rule, and that's a that's a whole other other area that most cities don't want to go into just because of the hassle of calling the record keeping and the money that it costs to do that. So please keep that in mind. Uh, anytime you guys have any kind of questions about that, please let us know. <coughs> there are a lot of great ideas out there, but we want to make sure we're following along what we're doing. And we'll be more than glad to help you guys out through the, any of those processes and tell you where you can and can't do things. Uh, again, five with vegetation management, category six, this went to straight aquatic, uh, landscape maintenance we talked about. Uh, one other thing we talked about, we're going to talk about a little bit on the uh, Retesting part is that it clarifies charge for $52 for a retake of a private applicator exam for cost recovery, as well as other applicator exams that are charged there. In the old days, non political applicators like NFUR used to take all the exams for free. Okay? Well, initially, the first exams were still free. So if you go take a director's exam, for instance, on the A side, you take that first time as a non political, it's free. You fail that, then the next time around it's going to be fifty-two dollars per attempt. Okay, we have gone to this new third-party vendor that we use for the testing portion of it, and some of it is the, the cost recovery has to be there by CA in order for us to use the service, and it not cost the, the taxpayers or, or anything the TBA from that aspect. Like I said, again, the first round is free. Okay, so what this is important is <laughs> supervisor and employee both ways. Supervisor will give your employees time to be ready to take these exams. Employees, when you go to take the exams, make sure you're ready for it. Okay? And uh, I'll be honest with you, in, in the old days, what happened was a lot of times employees would show up month after month trying to go in and take this exam, and basically they're just rolling the dice to see if they got the answer right. And that's bottom line, guys. I, I tested them, I seen them, I got to know a lot of those people. You know? It's, <laughs> When, when you know somebody by name in the testing process and they're not taking a different exam, you've been here too long. Okay? The other thing is, I was always disappointed when a guy came up to me and said, What exam am I taking? I don't know what exam did you study for. Okay? So make sure you give your time, your employees time to study for the exam, because, like I said, after the first one, it's going to start costing money. Out. Adopted ready for application recertification. Um, one of the things you can do, like Allison says, is, is, is two entities being instructor of pest control and ag, and us both working under different laws. And as we're moving, and we've been together for eight years now, we're trying to get a little bit closer in, in our rules to kind of help the applicators out and to help us out, be honest with you. So we make some changes that are more similar to each other. Ag side just had a 60 minute requirement for CE programs, structural had 50, so ag went to 50 minutes. These usually take an hour anyway because you're going to talk up here for 50 minutes and hopefully you guys are going to ask some questions. So that's usually another 10 minutes right there. So keep that in mind that, you know, once we're done with this, we're going to have a little Q&A here. And then Allison and I are going to try to get to Austin before it freezes over here. Okay? Um, CE sponsors need to keep rosters for two years. Uh, the rosters have to include specific information. One of the things we're going to is uh, electronic rosters. So your rosters that are where you all sign in here will be sent to us electronically, and we're going to start monitoring those a lot more in order to do audits for CEUs. So it's real important that you maintain your 
your city new certificates, okay? How many city news do not work for the have to have that in a year? Anybody? Five. Are you sure? Are you sure? Five, right. I was kidding. Uh, definition, we have a human factor in aerial application to you. People who do crop dusting and such are made and spray factor control um, with planes. When they get the aerial category, which they have to have when using planes as part of the equipment they use for making applications, their CEUs are a little different than now. They have to have what's called a human factor. So any CEUs they get have to include how it affects humans. It's not just um, any CEUs um, like differentization. They'll get differentization, but it has to have some sort of human factor on how that differentization could be affecting humans and uh, some of the, the issues that go along with humans getting drifted upon. So. As the military deployment for CEU extension requests, so the um, TKA as a, as a as department has always honored um, CEU extensions for, for um, enlisted uh, men and women that go overseas and aren't able to keep up with their licenses, but now it's officially in the law. So. Like I said, some of these are a little late coming, but they've come through, and they're not too big of a major deal for you guys, so that's always a good part, is I don't mind introducing some new rules when they're not too burdensome on you. Adopted rate for licensing. Um, this is for 3A. It's a uh, applicant business vehicle identification details to be on each motor vehicle used by a commercial or non-commercial applicant with the 3A category. One thing I want to tell you, this does not apply to you guys. It does not apply to non-com political. I just want you to know this because if you should hear it out, out in the real world, if somebody says you have to have a decal because y'all are doing, you know, maybe spraying a park or something like that, that does not apply to the non-com political. It only applies to the commercial and non-commercial application, especially the landscaper is doing it as a business. The doctor rate for use and application. After prohibition of use for pesticides canceled by EPA without a discontinuation of use state. A lot of times when EPA is putting a product and they're going to discontinue it, they'll put out a, maybe a two to four year time frame where it's going to be canceled, it's going to slowly be used up in the market, and then it should be gone. So it's kind of a phase out period. Some, of the, some products didn't have a phase out period, so now if for some reason you're caught with the use of one of these products, then it will become a violation now. I was joking the other day with a group of young farmers down the road, and uh, I was talking about chlorinate. Okay? How many of y'all have ever heard of chlorinate? I will turn my medicine, real good medicine, listen to all my old medicine. But um, it, it was used back in the day, really good product, lasted a long, long time. You can pull it out. I was joking with these guys about chlorinate because last year, in Plainview, on Craigslist, which I'm a big fan of, there was somebody selling it. So we referred it to EPA. It's $500 a gallon. So we referred that to EPA. Well, I'm joking with them thinking that's the last I'm going to hear it. And actually, 17 and a half years ago, maybe 14 years ago, that was the first thing I worked with on the board. Um, we won't get into that one a lot of time. But in laughing about it, this is one older farmer, you know, and this is funny because this is a young farmer group. There's nobody under 50 in that group. The young farmers. I call it my old one farm because I talked to it for years. But anyhow, I was talking about Florida and once raised their hand and he goes, You can still get some. I'm like, Whoa, what do you mean you can still get some? I'm like, I know you're not selling it. He goes, No, 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 not me. He goes, I was just looking on Craigslist, which I, I was proud because this guy's probably 60 something years old. He, he's on Craigslist, boy. He's getting after him on the touch screen. But there was Florida for sale right up the road from Austin. And it just amazes me that these products are still out there. You should have it. It's, it's still out there, we're, we're, we're going to work on that, but if you, you should want to look at it, it's probably still on there. Don't buy it. You just look at it right now. Um, but anyhow, that, there are still things out there like that, guys. But I always try to tell people when we're talking about stuff like this is don't order more than what you need. That's the biggest thing. A lot of people are coming across, you know, grandma and grandpa passed away, they're inheriting property, they're inheriting barns, people are buying properties. There's a lot of the soul stuff out there. Okay? It's no good, guys. Don't get it out there anymore. Stay away from it, especially if you don't know what it is. I watched a real interesting presentation when I was a new inspector and saw a gentleman who put it out, put out some chemical he didn't know what it was, mixed it with a cup of coffee, you know, a coffee cup and some water, kind of figured out what it was, ended up killing about 15 to 30 cattle. And it wasn't a whole lot that he used, but you know how big cattle are. So keep that in mind, guys. These things are dangerous. 
As long as you've got the, the lead one that goes with them, you follow those instructions, you're good to go. But don't be trying to figure out what something is on the test. Okay? That's what saves you up for the day. Uh, reformat SSO information is easier to reference. SSO is state limited use. Uh, makes it more readable by definition. So there's no real change to the list. Has anybody ever seen what the state limited use list is? Those are products, and actually they're active ingredients, when in a, in a product require a license. Okay, does anybody know what the one thing about all those SOUs is? They're all herbicides. The only difference is now. The state limited use is going to be something like malathion when put through an area, through a plane, or through a tire driven bobber. That's going to become state limited use, but we're not calling a certain product. We're not calling malathion that. We're just saying a general use product when put out through a bobber or plane is not considered state limited use and requires license. Okay, so that's kind of the new change for you guys. Basically, that's going to require y'all to go use a bobber and any general use product to be licensed. Keep in mind, we'll talk about supervision in a second. Um, about to get the headline, so sorry. Um, so that state limited use just talked about that. So state limited use status is for applicators employed by a public entity or contracted by a public entity uh, to provide public health pest control or supervised by such. Uh, so you must have a public health pest control category, which is 12 still. Um, but again, keep that in mind. You can have a commercial applicator out there that has vector control as a category on the ag side. That's the only work that you can do in the first political subdivision. So you can have a commercial applicator on the ag side. Get the category 12 vector with the pest control. Um, so we tell pest control. And then they have, all their work has to be done for a public uh, political subdivision. Okay? They cannot do any other work. They're going to do any any uh, commercial work that for, for mosquito control, they have to do it through the structural pest control side with pest control category. Again, this is the same thing that used these are pesticides such as 2,4-D, dicampa, propanil, bromophil, uh, promethone, MCPA, chemical. Again, those are all herbicides. Okay? So whatever you're thinking about is something say let me use, keep in mind it's all going to be herbicides, except for the fact that you're using general use products. Through a plane or a power driven popper, then that becomes a good use as well. Regardless of what the product is, it just has to do <clears throat> if you're putting it out in that manner. Uh, Records of application. Uh, we have a permanent exemption now for one direction uh, velocity record keeping. A lot of this we used to get grain in when they were making uh, fumigation applications because grain in on the corn or something. That kept that, those requirements where you had to put the wind in the, in the direction. If you're in a grain bin, there is no wind, therefore it's not coming from any specific direction. So now instead of writing a letter that exempts somebody from that, we just made it into a rule and we'll have to do that. Uh, requires application method or type of equipment used. This is another change that we've had. So we, you're going to also have to put what type of application or method did you use to put out the product? Was it a bogger? Did you put it out there a boom sprayer or something like that? Um, we're working on the record keeping form right now to make that change. So y'all can go ahead and start working on making those changes now. Um, probably the next week or so we should have we should have that record keeping form out there on the on the website. Uh, it also makes documentation to verify training of persons working under the supervision of a licensed applicator part of a pesticide record keeping. What this does is it makes your direct supervision affidavit or any kind of uh, training that you did for your people it makes it required that you keep it for two years. We used to not have a requirement. We put one in because we worked in plants where somebody's left the job and nobody keeps up with the paperwork as far as the training went on that individual understanding and learning how to use pesticides. Then they walk away from the business, the company, and say that they were never trained. Nobody has paperwork. This way it makes it a part of record keeping. So the employer does have that information available because now it's a little bit different. Uh, registration inspection of equipment. We used to, Mark used to have to register their equipment. They used to have to notify the Department of Ownership changes. They don't have to do that anymore. We used to issue a different kind of decal for those pieces of equipment that they use. We're not going to do that anymore. But the other thing is that it does affect you guys is just make sure it clarifies the TA can inspect equipment and issue a stop use order on that product, on that equipment. So if you've got leaking novels, 
if you've got spray tags that are leaking, anything like that, we can stop use where you can't use that equipment until you fixed it and we have proof of it working correctly. Okay? So keep that in mind when you're looking at all your equipment. Uh, make sure it's working, not leaking. Guys, that's just in, that's dental safety right there. That's common sense to protect your guys, make sure nobody gets hurt. Okay? Like I said, these rules were adopted. They were adopted on February, um, in January. They went into effect February 17th, so they're in effect. A lot of these things, like I said, we're working with our inspectors and just getting them to understand that, you know, we're going to ease into it. But keep in mind, there's going to be a time where all this is required. I mean, by law, it's required now. But we're going to kind of let everybody ease into it to try to get the word out and make sure everybody sees this. Because the hard thing with this kind of stuff, you can't talk about it until it's in writing. It finally got into writing in February. So now we're putting it on the website and doing talks like this um, to get that information out there. Uh, some of the changes you can see here, or if you just go look at the laws and regulations books now and some of the stuff that we talked about, it's in there on our website to, um, for, for viewing. Uh, this summer, TA conducted a random audit of applicators. Um, I got it. You look comfortable. Don't think the failure to meet senior requirements for renewal were, renewal were for as much as 600 bucks. So maintain your CEUs and keep track of your, your certificates. The CEU audits. The licensee shall notify the department within 30 days of any change of information provided as part of the application for a license. Failure to provide such information may be ground for denial, suspension, or revocation of a license. The applicator can still be penalized even if they didn't receive the audit letter because they moved and did not notify TDA. So if you moved recently, make sure TDA is aware of your new address. The reason I bring this up is during the audit process, what we did, we took a group of folks that are new. We looked in the CEUs that we have available to us. We took out all those people that met their CEU requirements. We have about 200 folks left that we couldn't prove that they met their requirements. So we sent them all 200 letters. Of course, we get some back because people have moved and did not notified us. Okay, those people still got penalized. And once we did track them down, their excuse was, well, we moved. Well, by law, you have 30 days that you have to tell TDA that you moved as part of the licensing process. Whether you're just getting licensed, or most of the this is because you are licensed and you just have to focus. So that wasn't a way to get out of the penalties. Okay, like I said, the, the penalties went up to about 600 bucks. That's not a whole lot. It's a whole lot to me. Okay? And a lot of people go, well, that's not that much. Well, it's a lot to me. I've got plenty of other places I'd rather spend 600 bucks than units in the state of Texas. Okay? So once I always tell applicators, you give Texas enough, I'll give you when you have to. But like I said, think about it. Look at your licenses. Make sure our information is correct. You can always call us and just verify what contact with the information we have for you. If we don't have that, the correct one is just a check of your information form you can send us, and we can get you knocked out. And, you know, most of y'all are pretty good about it because it's a one-year license, so in that time frame, you can keep track of it. But some of our private applicators have a five-year license, and they don't always make those changes in time. So I just want to let you know that so you don't get any mind over that. Uh, out of the 200 we sent out, we have about 100 that... Um, So we have about 100 that can prove that they, they, uh, they did recently provide their certificates because they kept on hand. And we have about 90 that were penalized for lacking CEUs and they were due. Yeah. Y'all know this is an honor system. Okay? We take this to where we say, this, we send you the renewal, you're giving us your word that you take your requirements and you send it in. Okay? Well, I have 800 folks who have about uh, you know, 90 folks say, I'm just going to send that in and not do anything. Okay, guess what? They got busted. Okay? And that's where the, you know, that's where these things come from. It's important for you guys to come see you to learn the new and updated information that's going on out there. And it's important that we make sure that we do that. That way it keeps EPA off our back. They're comfortable with our recertification process as a state. And therefore, we don't add any more rules or any more laws to us that we have to maintain. We just keep doing business as normal. And not, like I said, not add any more laws to what we're already doing. Um, Big thing is let those that are not here know this. You know, hopefully you don't know anybody that cheated the system and just sent in the results. Because guess what? We're probably going to do it again this year. We've done it the last two years. 
We're already talking about doing the, the mobile this year. Okay? So keep that in mind. This is just a little break. The tab is in. Are you going to get to that in the back? There's some seats up here in the front. Tomorrow, I'm going to take out a white. Because I was uh, testing for poisons in the cookie jar. Ag supervision. The license applicant is responsible for assuring the person working under his or her supervision are knowledgeable of labor requirements and pesticide rules and regulations. Proof of training is required. You can use signed label, a signed affidavit, or even worker handbook training. How many of y'all have seen the direct supervision affidavits? Y'all should all go to the website and make it If you're a license applicator, and you're supervising folks that are unlicensed. And that's fine, there's no problem with that. There's a direct supervision affidavit on our website. What it is, it's a form that goes between the licensed applicator and the unlicensed applicator, and it indicates to, it goes both ways. For the employer, it proves that you've trained an employee how to use pesticides, on the label, and they understand what laws and regs are working under as far as the ag side goes. For employees, it ensures that you know that your employer has taught you how to use these products, you understand the rules and, and the regulations that you're following. Where I see a lot of this coming into play, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, is when people leave the business. Okay? When people get fired, they quit, for various reasons, a lot of times they get mad once they're gone. One of the easiest things to come back on a lot of people in this industry is the fact that I wasn't trained on how to use pesticides. And you're supposed to do it based on this law. Okay, so if you haven't ever seen one, go look at the direct supervision affidavit under our um, under the agriculture side of the forms. Okay, we'll have some information uh, later. Any of y'all right now, you can write down my phone number. My direct line is 512-463-7692. Again, it's 512-463-7692. I'll be more than glad to email you one. It doesn't take me that long. Uh, compliance can equal WPS handbook training. Usually WPS training is the work protection standard, which is a federal law that works uh, under farm forest nursery and greenhouse. It doesn't really apply to y'all, but you can use that training. It's basically a one-hour video, and you issue a handbook card to somebody, and that's your training. Okay? As non-commercial pool of applicators, y'all have to do this training on an annual basis. Okay? So keep that in mind. Again, looking for direct supervision affidavit. That's one of the easiest ways to do things. Go into the, in the, into the laws and regulations, look under record keeping, look under uh, storage. So good, two, two good places to look at as far as training goes. And then read the label with that applicator and make sure they understand how to use that product. Okay? A lot of applicators, the supervised application restricts the use state when you can regulate herbicides. If the label does not prohibit such action, make sure you read your label and it does allow you to do that. So there are some labels that you have to be a licensed applicator to use. Okay? So make sure that over the years, labels do change. Make sure you're keeping up with those changes. There's the discrepancy of supervision requirements. We always use the greatest degree of supervision that shall apply. A licensed applicator may not supervise an applicator whose license is under suspension or revocation. The license application does not need to be physically present during the application. Okay? By TEA Ag Law, you do not, the licensed person does not have to be there. Now, if your political subdivision has a different rule, you should follow that one. Okay? But by law, under our law, we wouldn't hold that against each other. But again, if y'all are working under something different, if your political subdivision, you need to follow that uh, along with what your supervisor suggested. Uh, the licensed applicator is responsible for the actions of the applicators under his or her under his or her supervision. Keep that in mind. If you're a licensed applicator and you're supervising unlicensed folks, it, all their mistakes will count as your mistakes too. Okay? So that's for the very credit that you train them correctly. I'm going to really talk about this part. Uh, unlicensed applicators can take five CEDs also to satisfy training requirements. Uh, proof of training is required to be kept for two years. This is the direct work of direct supervision affidavit form works really well. Yes, sir. I'm going to try to keep this brief up because it's not a whole lot of structural people here. Structural supervision differs greatly. I know we can keep seeing that we have very different laws. So structural supervision, we have two different, first off, let me say you don't have anyone working unregistered or unlicensed. You have to be licensed and you have to be registered. 
registered in order to do instructional application. Depending on the type of in person we're dealing with, that person is an apprentice. So I'm going to skip down to the third bullet here. An apprentice is an individual who does not have a license and they're registered to begin work and train. They're not allowed to work independently until they're fully trained. That training is described in 7.133, Technician License Requirements under lowercase h. Um, I have it listed here. So once they've completed that training, they're able to work independently. That means there does not have to be a licensed applicator present with them while they're doing services. That is exactly how a technician works, a licensed technician in the structural industry. So they still need to meet with a responsible certified applicator, who is a certified applicator designated for that business, three times a week for personal instruction. They are once again are able to work independently, but they have to meet with a responsible certified applicator by rule, physically, so it means face to face, not Skype, not over the phone, they actually have to be present in the same room. Certified applicators, which I imagine most of you are, who work for non commercial political entities, certified applicators have no supervision requirement. You are able to work on your own with no supervision. So those are the key differences. Um, but I want to stress once again that no one can work if you're structurally licensed underneath your license. This is a huge difference from the way the ag side of things work.
If something should happen to your equipment, or you have to get away from that job for more than maybe a couple hours, start over and do another 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 application. And I'll tell you why. In a lot of places, you don't know what happens in a couple hours. In my farming communities, everybody's out of the green tractor. At least that's what everybody thinks. And I've had I've actually worked for clients where I've had people that were reported to be driving a green tractor making an application. But luckily, in their record keeping form, they had enough sense to make the notes right that showed that they were not in the vicinity, and that it was actually somebody else, and it was actually not even in the same area of where the person thought the problem was. Okay? Because let me tell you something about complaints. They never, rarely ever come in on the same day. They generally come in two, three, four weeks later. So right now, think about this. A month ago, what were you doing at this time? On Wednesday. No telling. When it comes to this kind of work, that's where your record keeping comes into play. It reminds you of what happened. Anything that happens weird that day, note that. You know, these, these are all little things you don't necessarily think about during the application process, but think about it when it comes to if down the road I needed to remember this, what would help me tell my memory to do this? Because again, if you're in a complaint inspection, it probably won't happen until two, three, four weeks down the road. Okay, so keep that in mind. Any questions at this point? The name of the person for the application is um, is doing it for Los Angeles City, whatever county, yeah, whatever. Uh, location of land to be sprayed, stated in a manner that would permit inspection. I have a lot of people in, in, in y'all's um, business with this, with the municipalities and such, who basically divide up a map and put it into quadrants or something like that, and indicate something like A, B, C, or D. And that tells us where the application was occurring. Because again, you know, those applications many times are going up and down the roads. It's mileage, it's you know, a lot of streets and stuff like that. Um, it's easier to do that. Just make sure you stay in a manner that will permit inspection. Okay? For each pesticide applied, the product name. That's pretty cut and dry. The product EPA registration number. In the product EPA registration number, are there any letters? In the EPA registration number on the product, are there any letters? No? Are you sure? Good, you're right. There are none. If you're writing down an EPA registration number and you have letters in it, you're writing down the wrong thing. There is something on that label that's right underneath the registration number that's called the EPA establishment number, and lots of times that will have a letter. That's where that container will fall away. Okay, that's usually the state. That's where we get into the product establishment that we were talking about earlier. If you take a big container and you break it down and put it into a small container and then set up like that, that's what we're talking about, the establishment number. That's where they take in a 50,000 gallons of a chemical and put it into a two and a half gallon container. That's repackaging. That's what that number indicates. It's basically the area or the location where that product was taken from a big container and put into a small container like a two and a half gallon container, or it could be the 200, 300 gallon totes, stuff like that. Those places have to be registered by EPA and meet a lot of requirements. Okay, so don't be repackaging on your own. Now when you're talking about service containers, when you're moving products from big containers, you're mixing it up and you're going to go out with it, that's totally different, that's allowable. Okay? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Yeah. Okay, drop EPA registration number. Rate of product per unit, that's how much of that chemical you're putting into um, your mix. The total volume is everything put together, your chemical, your water, any of juvenile, anything you're putting in there. Name of the pest for you guys, mosquitoes, that's pretty much all y'all are going after on the adult side. Site treated, again, that could um, be treated for, for, um, for the mosquito. Number of acres, a lot of y'all can see, take the mileage, you can do the division on the street. Um, figure that out to get the, um, the volume. Uh, wind direction, velocity, and air temperature. FAN number, if you had aerial equipment. Because actually, does anybody have aerial equipment in here in your mosquito district? There are some in Texas that actually do. We worked with one, they put out 42,000 acres of product in about two hours. A lot of coverage. I'm oh, sorry, last one. Type of equipment you used, remember put boom sprayer, bunker, hose model, whatever you were using at the time. Uh, record of pesticide application shall be legible in a format that clearly identifies. 
It says for each specific item of information requirement uh, is required by the section. Find it in a way that everybody can read it or type it. Find it in the GA record keeping form we provide or at least meet all the requirements for that. Here's a copy of our record keeping form on the ag side. You're welcome to use it. If you don't use it, at least meet all the requirements that are on it. What's required on a structural use record? So usually I do like a question and answer here and I ask everyone what's required on the use record. But I don't want to call out my two licensees here, so I'm not going to do it. But I'm going to list the items here. There's nine items required on the use record. We have um, the name and address of customers actually listed with the operational data. It's kind of confusing. I don't know why we wrote it that way in our next record. We just want to be The name of the test side with EPA or device with EPA registration number, um, the total amount that you're applying, the mixing for the active ingredient to change to like an RTU product, the mixing rate or percent of active ingredient, and the total amount of material applied. We also have uh, the target test and the device, or the, the test for which the device or uh, test type is used. I'm actually just going to go ahead and go through these quickly because we're running out of time. But what I really want to spend time in, on is this. It's a table that kind of shows you the difference between the use record for a structural use applicant, for a structural use, and for an ag use, depending on which authority you're licensed under. You can tell from this graph that there's requirements that differ. For instance, just highlight a few. On the ag side, you are required to record the product name as well as the EPA registration number. On the structural side, we allow you to do either one. We additionally have a requirement that if you're using a pesticide device, which I'm not sure how many of you have used a pesticide device on an ag but, uh, application, whereas in structural, you have, like, for instance, snap traps, like for rodents, that's a pesticide device. You have to record on your structural pest control use record. Uh, additional changes or differences. Like I talked earlier about supervision and who's allowed to do what type of work. On the structural use record, you're always going to have your name and your license number. The person who's applying is, is you. On the ag side, you may be recording your name and the actual license guy's nice license number and who you're making that application for. Um, there's also some differences on the structural side that we don't allow you to just put like a location or an area. You're going to have to actually put an address because most of our settings are urban settings. It could be a block number, like I created the 500 block of this block. If you're structurally licensed, you're doing mosquito applications. Uh, but these are just some differences. This little chart kind of highlights the differences between the two. Um, here's our top 10 for the commercial side. So this is with the structural pest control, we not only license the non-commercial political, like the case of you here, but also commercial businesses. Uh, for instance, the company that's putting all this, this conference on is commercially licensed. He's one of my licensees, and it's a little video. Um, so this just gives you an idea of our top 10. Our top 10 included number one and nine, which are the pest control use record issues. You'll see on the far right, your, well, my right, oh, your right, actually, is the uh, one through 10, their order in which they fell. And on the second two left columns, the occurrence and the prevalence. So how many times it occurred, and then how prevalent was it of all the inspections that we do? Because last year we did over a thousand inspections of commercial businesses. This just gives you an idea if anyone is commercially licensed, and I can share this information easily by email. So I want to talk a little bit about the testing real quick. To be quick and dirty, but I want to get a little bit of the information out just in case you're sending someone to test sometime soon. So the key thing here is don't load yourself up with more than you can when you're going to test because there's a few steps you have to take before you can actually go take that exam. So here's kind of a step-by-step -step procedure. First thing, you need to know what you need to test for. Often I will, someone will tell, I need a pesticide applicator license. I'm like, okay, do you need an average structural license? Dead silence on the phone. No answer. And I ask, well, what do you want to do? What type of work are you trying to do? So from that, and me calling out after question after question, I can figure out what type of work they're wanting to do. So know what you need first. Do you need a structural license or do you need an ag license? Like I said, we have two authorities so we're trying to get it confusing, like Perry said. Um, once you know what license you need, go get that study material. It's sold by the Texas A&M Agri Life Extension. I can speak from all it's not sales. But, and their number is there. You can call them and order the books from them. We unfortunately can't sell you them. We don't have any on hand to sell you. Um, next, you're going to fill out the application for the license. You can actually probably do two and three concurrently. There's going to be an application on our website for the particular type of license you're applying for. When you apply, you can be able to include the fee. If you don't include the fee, we're going to send you and you're going to be waived. It's about a two-week or ten-day processing period. Once we process the license application, 
which you can find at these two websites, by the way. They're technically the same site. The only difference is the forward slash SBCS brings you directly to the structural page if you need a structural app. So you can easily click on this link to this how to apply, how to schedule an SBCS licensing exam. Anyway, once you've submitted that application, we at TEA will create an account for you. Once your account's created, we'll send you something that we like to call an eligibility letter. An eligibility letter has three very important things in it. First, it's going to have a seven-digit number. That's going to be the number that you're going to need to get the PSI when you call them. It's the second and third thing or go onto the website. The second and third thing on that letter is a phone number for PSI and the web address for PSI. You can do it either way. When you contact PSI, you give them that seven-digit number. That's how they know you're good to schedule. Without that number, they're going to tell you you need to call us to get pre approved. Kind of FYI. PSI, by the way, operates 22 testing sites throughout the state. They're in every metropolitan area. They have at least four testing sites in the Dallas area. And they operate Monday through Saturday, sometimes even into the evening, at least 9 30. It's just kind of based on what type of availability they have. Um, once you take your exam, you get your grade set automatically because you take it on a computer and we raise your score in here. There's a few things I need to mention. Um, if you're taking a private applicator license, you need to take a private applicator training course beforehand. And don't let your license expire because we do, we still will require you to retest. We can't reenact your license. We do give you 365 days to renew, so that's a year. It's pretty generous, I think. But I've had people who told me 365 days wasn't enough. So just kind of FYI, keep that in mind. The structural exams, just to kind of highlight a few specific things about that. If you're taking the exam as a non-commercial certified applicator candidate, you will have to take a training course called the non-commercial certified applicator training course. It's a mouthful. Non-commercial certified applicator training course. It's a full day course and it's the exact same course as the technician training course for those who are trying to get a technician license. It's a little six hours as many as eight. That's why I did it's a full day. You'll have to submit a copy of that certificate with your license application. Don't forget the fees. The fees do differ. For a certified applicator on non-commercial political on our side, the social side, it'd be $108. For the ag side, it's going to be $12. That's the difference between them, but that's just how it is. Um, this, these slides are really just talking about the changes of switching to BSI and what's needed. So going ahead to ag exam. So, like Carrie mentioned earlier, and I'm just going to kind of go quickly over, for non-commercial politicals, the first test is free. Each retest is going to cost you $52. For if you're taking the exam for a commercial or non-commercial license, the first test is going to cost you $24, and each retest is going to cost you $52. Now, I'm going to end it on this, because a few updates are probably everything you've been waiting for. Hold on, one second. Yes, sir. Can you back up one more question? Just to make sure you understand, you can have a non-commercial license and you can have a non-commercial political license. Non-commercial license, let's say somebody works for a golf course, a private golf course. They're not a commercial applicator, they're a non-commercial applicator. We still charge you $24 for a category exam. If you have a non-commercial political, your first one is still free. Okay. The second one, if you fail the first one, the second one is $52. I just want to make sure that, yeah. you know, Allison's question, what she's saying, but understand that there's a difference between a straight up off court out here, guy that works at a golf course, private golf course, you know, take test, he'll pay 24 bucks. Somebody works for the city or the county, that's not common political, they'll won't pay anything for the first one. If they pay on the second one, we'll be $52. Does it ever reset? Yeah. Yeah, once you take this, what happens is your your account goes into the system. If you're licensed right now, your account is in PSI system. Because if you ever wanted to add a category, yeah, we want you to have that ability to just call them and add a category. Using your license. Yeah, using your license number. So you're, it's not, it's not going to forget. Well, this is a private company. They're the make money. That's their job. We hire them to do that. But they're not going to forget that you have to pass the exam. Believe me, they won't forget. Okay, so keep that in mind. Make sure you're ready to go take the exam. It's very personal. So, mosquito applications. First, I want to talk about which license you need, because this question gets often asked. So this little table kind of simplifies it and makes this on a visual level that you still have to read. So let me explain really quickly what this letter is, this table is saying. So public entities, city, counties, maybe even the state, if the state ever asked for it, are the only political entities that can use that public health test control non-commercial license. That's it. Okay, now if you are contracted, 
as a commercial entity to do work for a city or a county, you may use the public health pest control commercial license. That's what that third row, or fourth row, technically the third row at the table, second column is. That's why there's an asterisk there. It's trying to indicate you can do that under a commercial category as well, which is now public health pest control. If you're doing it for any other reason, you're not doing it under public health. You're doing it under nuisance pest control. The only people who have the authority for public health are public political entities like cities, counties, the state. Otherwise, you would have to license through my area, my program, the construction pest control service. So just to give you an idea of what this table says, the first row, or first column, that light gray, where we have three check boxes, is just basically saying you can use a structural license technically to do it, you can use an ag license to do those applications, or if you're strictly just using dumps, you don't necessarily need a license because of the general use of once again, if you're using the power-driven machinery or an airplane to apply that pesticide, even if it's general use, you now need a license. If you're not doing it for a public entity, you're doing it for, let's say, an HOA or for a, a private residence or a golf course or anything like that, a private golf course especially is what I'm talking about, you need to have be structurally licensed. You can't actually do this work under the Category 12 or the Public Health Pest Control. Additionally, let me break the bad news, if this is bad news, though this may be well known. TDA has no law, there's no statute, and there's no regulation that will allow you, a licensed applicator, to enter private property to make a pesticide application, even if it's for public health. Our law just doesn't encroach in that area. The only thing you're going to find in law that even kind of helps you, and you're probably already aware of it, is from the 83rd regular session, which is the session that happened last spring, or in 2013. Um, in Senate Bill 186. And Senate Bill 186 allows, it, it amended, this is the DSHS's law, so there is, I mean, there are compatriots here in the room, you're probably well more versed than I am in this law. But it basically allows you to enter uh, an un, a, uh, abandoned uh, property that may be foreclosed or you have reasonable uh, reason to leave that property abandoned to inspect and to make applications. But there are posting requirements if you do make an application of a dump, because it's all you're able to use are dumps. Uh, you have to leave a posting letting, I guess, presumably the tenant who may come back to that property know that you made an application there. Uh, for more information on this, because we aren't, we have basic knowledge, we are not probably the most first people on the law change from Senate Bill 186, DSHS is your probably best person to talk about this. And, of course, there may be changes from the 84th regular session that's currently going on. Um, Bill Dye, I think, is not even passed yet. It's probably a week from now, a week or two weeks from now. So they can still introduce a bill that can change what even this says currently. 